the language is so difficult, isn't it, when talking about schizophrenia, but also mental health in general, because are we talking about a mental thing or a physical thing? Sure. Are they patients? Are they, you know? Sure. Why is the language so fraught? It really is, you know, it really is. And in, um, in researching this book, it became clear to me that there is no uncontroversial language when talking about uh, mental illness. Uh, and that includes the phrase mental illness. Yeah. So you mentioned patient there, and I think I think that the, the collective name for people accessing treatment is a really good, really good example. If you're a user of mental health services, um, and you subscribe to the view that uh, the distressing thoughts and feelings that you're having uh, are an illness, uh, presumably located within your brain, and exactly the same as a, a physical illness. Mm. Um, then you might prefer to, to think of yourself as a patient because if you're exactly the same as those patients receiving care for, uh, for, for, for diabetes or heart disease or, or, or cancer or whatever, uh, then why would you want to be called something different? Mm. However, there is another view. And if you subscribe to the, to the view that even the most alarming uh, and distressing uh, and uncharacteristic of your thoughts and feelings and behaviours are not symptomatic of illness, um, but are rather uh, an expression of trauma or undischarged grief uh, or poverty, then to see all of that wrapped up in a, in a medical language that starts with the word patient mm. might be seriously problematic. Mm. Uh, language is kind of everything. Mm. I think a, a, a truth that's not widely appreciated um, is that for the vast, vast majority of uh, the mental illnesses, if we're going to use that term, yeah. Um, the diagnosis isn't arrived at by looking at a blood test or a brain scan or, or, or anything of the sort. Uh, rather, it's the words people say or do not say, as interpreted by professionals, that as much as anything else will determine a diagnosis. Mm. And that language of diagnosis, uh, for better or worse, can profoundly alter people's lives. So, so yeah, it's really important. <laughs> and you mentioned in your book, by looking at various people. I was going to say case studies, but actually you really do look at the people and what they've been through. And then you also look at their diagnosis and treatment. And it's not so clear cut, is it? And it's a bit more like a spectrum. Could you tell us a bit more about why that's a useful way of looking at mental health? Yeah, a spectrum could be a, a useful way of, of looking at it. And, um, and, and I'll come on to the spectrum, but it feels important to kind of lay the ground. Um, that doesn't mean that these um, diagnoses are arrived at completely arbitrarily. They're not. Uh, they're the names that we give to uh, human experiences that often seem to cluster together. So, uh, a, you know, a, a young, uh, an adolescent who uh, hears voices uh, might well also have some very unusual ideas and beliefs. Uh, they think that their neighbour is inserting thoughts into their head. Uh, they think that MI5 is tracking them. Um, and uh, that person might well also have withdrawn and their parents comment on the fact that they've withdrawn and they've lost motivation. And we see that pattern often enough that there emerges uh, this idea and we call the idea uh, schizophrenia. Now, a, a, a problem with that, a, a sort of spanner in the diagnostic works, is that human experiences don't like to be put in boxes. Mm. Uh, and, and, and when we do that, we find that these boxes often have quite blurred edges. So someone who experiences uh, many of the thoughts that we might associate with schizophrenia might also experience it, uh, many of the feelings that we associate with bipolar. And traditionally, psychiatrists' answer to this has been simply to create more and more and more of these boxes. So you've got something that looks a bit like schizophrenia and a bit like bipolar, if voila, you can have uh, schizoaffective disorder. Or if you have a quality of suffering that doesn't quite meet the, the threshold for an existing psychiatric diagnosis, uh, you know, you're not quite depressed, uh, that's fine, that can be dysthymia. You can still have a medical sounding diagnosis. Not quite bipolar, that's fine, that's cyclothymia. So there's like a disorder for everyone and there's more and more and more and more of them and we keep creating more. So to get to your point of the spectrum, sorry, uh, a, 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 an answer to that, if you agree that it's a problem, yeah. a solution to and I think it's a problem, if you agree that it's a problem, is you could just like get rid of those boxes. You could not bother with those quite unscientific diagnoses and you could instead focus on 
the experience. So focus on the symptom, for want of a better word, but the, 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 the actual experience. And you could think of the, uh, concentrate on the severity of that experience, which is where the, the sort of spectrum comes in, mm. and just concentrate on that and not bother with the packaging. Does that make sense? It totally <laughs> makes sense. <laughs> no, but you, you make great sense of what is a very, very complicated um, issue in, in this book. And one of the things which I thought was really interesting, many people will be watching this interview on social media. And social media is filled at the moment with a lot of people talking about mental health. And a lot of people are sharing their own experiences or their own thoughts on it. And the reason for this is often stated as being because they're trying to remove the stigma that surrounds mental health. Mm. And that is seen as being a very good thing about sort of opening conversation and debate. And you make a very interesting point about why removing the stigma of mental health might not be quite as sort of brilliant as, as it sounds. Oh no, it's so important to remove the to remove the stigma, um, and I think that anti-stigma campaigns have done incredibly important work in uh, broadening our conversation. And it's absolutely important that people feel more able to have these conversations. So, um, so I think they've done really, really important work. I think there's also a limitation to them, um, and that relates to what we've been talking about a little bit already, actually, which is that. For, for the historically, the anti-stigma message has subscribed uh, to this view that mental illness is exactly like physical illness. So you know you actually get that tagline, don't you? All schizophrenia is just like a broken leg. Mm -hmm. um, and as we've now discussed, it isn't really just like a broken leg. It's 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 much more it's much more complicated uh, than that. And so a, a, a potential problem with that message, I think. Um, and lots of people think, uh, is that it risks individualising what may actually be a social problem and what may actually be an issue of prejudice uh, and, and discrimination. So if we think about the causes uh, of this phenomenon that we call mental illness, we know that if you're living in an unequal society and that you're a very poor person, you're on the sort of bottom socio socioeconomic rungs of, of that society, um, then you are at a vastly increased risk of having the, 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 the kind of very distressing thoughts, feelings and behaviours that lead to a, to a mental illness uh, diagnosis. Um, and so here things get like a little bit political because that isn't, <laughs> that isn't, like, a, that isn't like a broken leg. Mm. If being poor makes it more likely that, that that's the case, then um, maybe instead of talking about stigma or as well as talking about stigma, we need to really start thinking about discrimination. And actually some of the, um, uh, the people that I interviewed in the book uh, uh, made what I thought was a, a very good comment that, um, that we, don't talk about the, um, we don't talk about the stigma of being a woman or the stigma of being black. We talk quite rightly about sexism and racism. Uh, and so perhaps we need to move the, the stigma conversation in that, by, in that direction a little bit. There is an argument, you could make an argument, um, that it serves the interest of uh, some people in positions of power um, that we uh, think in terms of this sort of medical model and that we do uh, in internalise this experience mm. and, and individualise it. So, so um, uh, to, you know, if we take a, a, a young uh, millennial who is, or a young person, uh, <laughs> uh, who is... Um, you know, they're having a really, really difficult time in life and they are, are because it's hard to be young now, um, and they are struggling to uh, pay their ever-rising rent costs, uh, paying, you know, two-thirds of their salary from a zero-hours contract in order to rent a sort of mouldy room in a, in, a, in a shared house and they're not sure that their next paycheck's even necessarily going to come because of how the economy's now built. Um, it might serve the interests of people uh, in positions of political power, uh, that that person is seen to be suffering from a panic disorder, uh, something that can be neatly sort of packaged away and, 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 and seem to be a problem inside their own mind, uh, rather than to countenance the, the possibility that actually the real sickness uh, lies elsewhere. It's a great point to end on, uh, Nathan. Is, uh, as I say, you, you make it incredibly clear in the book um, what we can learn from the differences between how people suffer from schizophrenia. Um, so thank you for making that journey so easy to understand. Thank you very much.